Between December 1989 and April 1992, seven young backpackers between the ages of 19 and 22 just vanished in New South Wales, Australia. What should have been the adventure of a lifetime would prove to be a living nightmare, leading to their untimely deaths. Their remains would later be found in the Belanglo State Forest. Though badly decomposed, the bodies would show signs of torture and a brutal end. One intended victim, however, would manage to escape and help the police bring a ruthless, sadistic serial killer to justice. This is the chilling account of the backpacker murders. This is the case of Ivan Miller. Before I get on with today's true crime video, you may ask, why are you on an incredibly comfortable looking bed, Emma? Well, I'll tell you why. That's because the lovely people at Emma Mattress are sponsoring this video, and for good reason, because I am a committed Emma Mattress user. Every single person in my home, in my family, have it, and so now does my brother and my mother. I am a literal spokesperson for them because I sleep so incredibly well on my mattress. And more than that, look, I'm a massive preacher around mental health. And when it comes down to mental health, sleep plays such an active role in maintaining well-being. Any of you out there who've ever struggled with insomnia know exactly what I mean. So anything that promotes that is really, really important and integral. And what is also amazing, because you know I like a bargain. Well, Emma. Mattress is having a Black Friday sale. In fact, it's the biggest Black Friday sale that they've had yet. So grabbing an Emma mattress is a real investment that's worth making right now. You get up to 60% off, you get free delivery. And if that was not enough to convince you, and it should be, you also get 200 night trial. So if you sleep on it for 199 nights and then you're like, no, I'm not sure this is for me. Well, that's okay. Click on the link in the description to take advantage of the Emma Black Friday sale and get up to 60% off plus an exclusive discount with my code. Literally, guys, it is an investment that I have never, ever regretted making. Look how comfortable I am. Enough of all that. Let's get on with the video. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm going to be doing this in a very comfortable place today, aren't I? But unfortunately, whilst the bedroom is a lovely place for a peaceful time, what I'm going to be talking about today is the stuff of literal nightmares. I watched a film that's based on this many years ago, and it is rare that a film traumatises me in any way, shape or form. But let me tell you, it did. Because, first of all, Australian actors are flipping really good when it comes down to horror. But secondly, it just felt ultimately so close to home. The areas I'd been, the places I'd traveled relocating vehicles when I lived in Australia, just taking these crazy roads that were literal B roads, completely off the beaten track, and never thinking for one minute that I could have been unsafe. And even the time frame is scary. This happened a few years earlier than when I started traveling, but I really felt like I could connect with those individuals. It's one of those moments where you think this could have been me. It really could have been me. You asked for this to be covered. So many of you have asked. I think we've had over 200 requests for this. So I hope I do it justice. And for those of you who know this case, please get in contact, let me know your thoughts. It's always so interesting to me to hear what you think and what you make of certain aspects of these crimes. Leave me a like, a comment, get involved in a live chat. If you're new here, please subscribe. If you like crime content, I release mine on a Wednesday and a Sunday. Crime and consistency is my motto, along with some others like bang to rights. If you're new here, you will get to know that about me. 
Ivan Robert Marco Milat. That's his name. He was born on the 27th of December 1944. He was born in Sydney, Australia, which is a gorgeous area of the world. Now, he was the fifth child of 14 children. That's a lot of kids. Obviously, it's a different time frame, but arguably we can immediately believe that intentionally there may have been some issues purely on the basis of numbers. It's not being disrespectful to the family and a large sibling experience, just commenting on the time issue. Now, they had the mother, Margaret. Now, she was Australian born. And then they had the father, Stephen Milat, and he was actually Yugoslavian. He was an immigrant from Yugoslavia itself. Now, according to a sibling, Millet did have a happy childhood. That's what they say. They commented on this and brought out that it was not a troubled childhood. He did leave school after eighth grade. That's 15 years of age. And he does get a job welding chicken cages. Apparently enjoyed camping. He enjoyed target shooting, which believe me, will be brought to life in the most horrible way later on. He also was an avid reader. He liked motorbike riding. He actually broke his arm at 14 in a motorbike accident. Now that's what a sibling has said about his childhood. But there are some quite contrasting reports, I would say, and those contrasting reports suggest that he experienced quite a dysfunctional upbringing. First of all, the family were very insular. They kept themselves to themselves. And I suppose when you have a group of 14 siblings, that you have your playmates around you. It's not gonna be difficult to amuse yourself when you have such a large group of people that belong to your family unit. And that would make isolating themselves more simple because there's so much to do just as a family. Also, people have said that his father was allegedly violent. Whether that's true or not is debatable. He was certainly known to be a disciplinarian, but again, large amount of children, probably quite difficult to control and contain, maybe used discipline as a method of ensuring that there were some boundaries in that unit. Also, some reports say that Millat was already, as a really young child, showing some signs of psychopathic personality. One of his brothers claimed that he took a machete and he cut a dog in half with it. I don't know about you, I already dislike Ivan Millat quite a lot. He'd have to do a huge amount of work to even get to the position of me believing it's not going to be a purgatory experience on death for doing that. But this is what a sibling is reporting, that this is violence within him. And we see animal torture certainly as often a trait in the childhoods of individuals who become serial killers. He would also have a really disturbing conversation with an acquaintance where he talked about how to turn a person into a head on a stick by stabbing them in the spine. Now, ironically, when we talk later on about the crimes, that's a technique that he really did use. He put that to use in an absolutely horrifying fashion down the line. On top of this, Millet develops this, I would say, unhealthy obsession with guns. I appreciate different countries have different belief systems, and I don't know, maybe I was living somewhere where you could have a gun. I might, I might. It wouldn't be to kill animals, it would be self-protection. But I'm not sure they're called self-protection weapons, they tend to get called assault weapons, don't they? Because you tend to hurt people with them. I digress, it's irrelevant. I live in the UK, I'm not a farmer. I don't have a gun. But the fact that we've got these kind of violent traits developing, on top of this, we've got this obsession with guns, and the fact that he's constantly, and I mean constantly, photographed throughout his life with weapons, which I find strange. I have a lot of photographs. I actually lie, I don't have a lot of photographs. I'm a bit rubbish at taking photographs. But when I do have photographs, I tend to have like a dog, a child, a family member, a tree, me stood next to a tree, a waterfall, things like that. And if I were prone to take pictures of myself, I likely wouldn't think, Where's my AK-47? Where's my shotgun? Where's my caliber 22 pistol? You know, it's not the kind of thing that I'd expect would be a present within my photography collection. Where is my bow and arrow? Anyway, 
this is something that again says something about his nature he likes to be seen as powerful domineering he likes to be seen as certainly strong in the male context he has quite a stereotypical perspective of that i would imagine and he likes people to know about this prized collection of weapons and he amassed a huge collection of weapons his future ex-wife she described him as gun crazy that was probably because whenever she wanted like a nice family portrait ivan ivan let's have a nice family portrait i'll be there in a minute love ivan can you put down the crossbow it won't be a picture without a crossbow can you just leave the revolver and just get in this shot at the end of the day, it would be quite galling, wouldn't it, if there was no space on the mantelpiece when it comes down to it because your husband has an array of him just hugging certain weapons. And like I said, he had a huge collection. Now, Miller also displayed some troubling behaviours as a child. His criminal behaviour began then. He and several of his nine brothers, they actually all became pretty well known to police. And it's said that they all essentially displayed some really high level antisocial behavior. Miller, as you would imagine, doesn't begin with any grand crimes, so to speak. They're minor offenses, they're property offenses. And when he gets to the age of 13, the local constabulary will know exactly who he is and he ends up having to serve time in a juvenile correction centre. When he's released, it doesn't go well. It's gonna throw it out there. You imagine, don't you? You send somebody to a juvenile correction centre. Arguably, the juvenile, young person, is there to be corrected in their behaviour. Didn't quite work out though. Doesn't seem to correct anything some would say if you've got an individual who is developing antisocial personality traits the last thing you really want to be doing is to shove them in a place with loads of other young people who potentially have those traits they tend to learn from those individuals it tends to graduate their behavior that's exactly what happens because when he's 17 he allegedly shoots a taxi driver this is during a robbery and that taxi driver ended up paralyzed now he never faced justice for that crime. Instead, this completely innocent man got convicted and served five years in prison. That's unbelievable, isn't it? He didn't just allegedly paralyze this man, a completely innocent person served the sentence for him. Now, he continues in this criminal behavior and after serving 18 months for a shop break and this is when he's 19 years of age he is arrested again literally just months after his release because he's driving a stolen car at this point they sentence him to two years hard labor which we don't have in the uk anymore we did a little bit of trivia for you oscar wilde quite an amazing writer and poet and playwright he was gay and when it was discovered that he had perjured himself in court because he denied it because of some horrible things that were being said in the press about him, he was sent to prison and he actually received a couple of years hard labour as well because in the UK, I don't know, we were a little bit weird with our laws and apparently it completely destroyed him as a human being regarding physically because it was such hard work. So I wouldn't pretend for a minute that Miller doesn't find two years hard labour challenging but it doesn't seem to change his behavior. The consequences don't seem to in any way affect the criminality. So we get to the age of 23. Bear in mind, he's only just got out of prison for hard labor. He then gets sentenced for a further three years for theft. So it's as if whatever he wants to do, he does without fear of consequence. There is nothing affecting him psychologically enough to make him change his behaviours. And the problem with that is if the very punishment that is meant to fit the crime fails to do so and the consequential experience of the criminal is not swayed or persuaded off that track, then an escalation in that kind of offending is to be expected. Because if you don't have a fear of those consequences, then you're always going to think about what you wish to do for yourself, irrespective of what may happen the next day, week or year because of those behaviours. 
Now we get to April 1971. And I would say this is when we have an absolutely, at least notable, I'm not saying these things hadn't happened before previously, I'm saying that this is notable at this point. There's a marked graduation in the seriousness of his offending behaviour. He's aged 26 at this point, and he's charged with rape and robbery of two 18-year-old female backpackers. So he picks them up on the same highway that he ends up finding the murder victims that we're going to talk about today. And bear in mind, in Australia, and as somebody who hitchhiked all over Australia and then relocated vehicles, picking hitchhikers up, this is very common, at least it was when I was younger. And you're always looking out for that friendly looking person who seems to know the roads, who's chatting away nicely to you, and you take that risk to get in the vehicle. And for somebody like myself, it always worked out. And you don't really think at that moment in time, because you're young and you're not thinking about possibilities, that something terrible may befall you. And so you're on the back foot your biases, it's going to be great, you're traveling, you're free, you're independent, everyone's nice. It might not be further from the truth than reality, but that's where you psychologically are at the time. So he picks up these two young women on this highway, then he threatens them with a knife, he binds them with rope, and he actually tells them that he's going to slit their throats, which must have been horrific, it's psychological torture, it's powerfully dominant, isn't it? It's not just, I'm going to do this to you. It's that I'm going to end your life and this is how I'm going to end your life. And he even said, will you scream when I slit your throat? So he's enjoying the titillation of seeing their terror. Now, according to the victims, they'd actually managed to persuade Milat not to kill them if one of them had sex with him. So they are able to manipulate Milat, at least initially, to not kill them. So after he rapes one of them, he then, again, is manipulated by these very clever women to stop for drinks at a petrol station. And here, they manage to get help and Millet is arrested soon after. This is a really important point to note. What we see in violent sex offenders is if they are caught and brought to justice after victims have escaped, they tend not to make that mistake again. They tend to graduate because they don't want to leave a witness. If you were a violent sex offender who is threatening people's lives, you were only a breath away from killing anyway. And the last thing you want is one of those victims to have power and control and domination over you. So we see this cycle where these very violent perpetrators who get sent to prison and have consequences because a victim was able to identify them and it caused them issues because of that, they kill because they don't want anybody to do that again. So anyway, in this scenario, even though he's done this very, very serious crime, he gets released on bail. Just off you go. Massively violent offender, threatened to kill two 18-year-old hitchhikers, rapes one of them. What could possibly go wrong if we release him? So first of all, he just carries on with his criminality, commits a series of robberies, and then, and this is a piece de resistance, I think. I've not covered one of these in my cases so far. He fakes his own death. He's like, it's gonna fake my own death. It's gonna work. So to avoid the trial, he leaves his shoes at the Gap. Now the Gap is like this renowned suicide spot in Sydney. And he leaves his shoes there with the belief that the police will be like, well, they're definitely Ivan Millet's shoes. He's gotta be dead. I've no idea why I'm doing that accent. I apologise in advance for anybody in Australia or New Zealand. I'm not even sure where that came from. But the point is, this is his mindset. And don't get me wrong, there's some sophistication there. He's waiting to go on trial for a very serious offence. There's a potential that he could have got depressed about it. Then his shoes turn up and he's completely disappeared. He wants it boxed off nicely and maybe it could have worked. Apart from... He gets re-arrested when he returns to Australia in 1974 because his mother has had a heart attack. I don't know whether Ivan Millet was like, surely after this period of time, they'll be like, ah, rape and robbery, it really doesn't matter. Be fine, be fine, just uh, let it go. Just let him back into the country. He's a nice guy. He's looking after his mother. What harm can this guy do? So basically he gets re-arrested, which should be a relief to all of us, right? Because finally he's facing his trial. He's got rape, robbery, and abduction charges. But let me tell you, the prosecution 
presented such a weak case, he was acquitted. Honestly, guys, any of us with 25 minutes reading the background info on the horrific attacks, also acknowledging he'd faked his own death and left to go to another country because he's clearly evidencing that he was indeed guilty, we could have gone and presented that case and won. I have no idea why we're talking about any subsequent crimes after this, because this guy should have been sent down for a very, very long time at this moment. And that's a big problem in cases like this, when the prosecution are absolutely shoddy, embarrassingly so, and that leads to an individual walking free from a certain prison sentence if, I don't know, they'd let Maureen in the canteen come and have a go because she'd have been more passionate. And I'm not even joking, genuinely, anybody, including myself, could have done this case and won because it's just so powerful. The evidence is there. I really mean this, guys. This is the problem. This is that sliding doors moment that I talk about often. This is his bound to rights moment. We've got witnesses who absolutely made it clear he raped and robbed and abducted them. We then have a staged faked death because he's escaping because he knows he's guilty. And then he gets rearrested when he returns. So arguably, we're in a scenario where we've got all this evidence that clearly validates that this is a guilty man. And yet he just walks free after raping, abducting, and threatening to kill women. The, the likelihood is he would have killed had they not been clever enough to find a way to escape in those terrifying moments. It's really frustrating because that would have been the end to his violent criminal behavior. And instead, not only is he given no consequences, he's left free to satisfy these warped desires with deadly consequences. And even though he didn't go to prison, what he knows is he could have gone to prison. So why would he ever think about leaving live victims again who may the next time mean that he's sent down for the rest of his life? Millat is incredibly arrogant superior and he's very narcissistic. And that means that as a human being, he's not considered or cared about anybody else's feelings apart from his own. He likes to hurt people. A man who likes to hurt people, women in particular, is now walking free, even though he's done some of the most heinous crimes that we can imagine. We get to 1975. At this point, Miller takes what I would consider the perfect job. He begins working as a truck driver. So he'd work on and off as well for the Roads and Traffic Authority for the next 20 years. So he has this perfect truck driving position. And what do we know about truck drivers? Well, they have access to a lot of hitchhikers, don't they? And also, if you're working as a truck driver and you're employed by the Roads and Traffic Authority, you kind of look like a trusted source to some degree. And he's consistent in that job. By all accounts, he's considered conscientious. He's considered a hard worker. But the truth is, it just serves to pay him to have the perfect ground to find victims. It's basically giving him a perfect opportunity to be a human predator whilst getting a paycheck for doing so. And it's this period that sees the evolution of Miller into a predatory serial killer. Before long, young travellers would just mysteriously begin vanishing. And I mean, vanishing into thin air. Now, Miller he lived close to Belanglo State Forest. Now, this forest is, like, incredibly large. It's almost 4,000 hectares, and it's located between Sydney and Canberra, South Australia. And this is where his hunting ground is. He knows the terrain. He knows exactly where he can hide bodies. Think about how tough that would be for investigators. And I have travelled those areas, believe me. It is no easy feat. It is a vast country. And... It's difficult even in the UK at times to discover bodies when people have disappeared because if people know how to dispose of them and they're in remote areas, think about Saddleworth Moors when it came down to Myra Hindley, etc. They are absolute evidence of the fact that bodies can be disposed of and never turn up. Keith Bennett has never been found. So in Australia, you can amplify that by like a million percent. 
He has the knowledge and that's going to put him way above the, any investigators because of the fact that he knows how to dispose of those bodies in certain places that would not even be considered unless luck would have it that somebody discovered a body, for example. So now he's driving and he's got this Nissan Patrol. He would actually go around in it just looking for unsuspecting victims and he knows who to go for as well. If you are a serial killer in this territory and you want to take people where there is some distance between you and the crime because first of all a backpacker is somebody who may often not be in contact with a family for weeks at a time back at this point in time and i can evidence it because i was doing it a few years after that you literally would have to go to the post restaurant which is where you'd go to a post office and you'd have told people where you'd be in the area as in i'll be in darwin i'll be in canberra i'll be in cairns i'll be in melbourne and you would go to the area that you were in and pick up mail that would be sent to that particular post restaurant we didn't have mobile phones so it's really difficult if you go missing for your family to even be aware of that until it becomes plaintively obvious. And he knows that. So he's creating this distance between himself and the crime. So he goes around looking for these people that he knows are going to be vulnerable. And he acts like he's a good Samaritan. He offers them lifts. Of course, we know that those actions of being the good Samaritan would be far from altruistic as contrary to altruistic, in fact, as anything could possibly be. In 1989, 19-year-old couple, they're Australian, James Gibson and Deborah Everest. They're passing through the Langlo State Forest area. They'd actually traveled from their hometown of Frankston, Melbourne. And this was Deborah's first trip away from Melbourne. It's unbelievably tragic, isn't it? Her first trip away, and it's going to be her last. They left Sydney to travel to the annual Confest Conservation Festival. This is on the 30th of December 1989, and they believe, as far as the investigation is concerned, that the couple were hitchhiking, and they just vanished without trace. And can you imagine how that would be for the family? Deborah had gone away for the first time, they probably feel guilty that they let her, even though it's a completely normal thing for any young person to do because that's the only time they let her out of their sights and then she's just erased from this world. And to not have any sense of closure at that point, to wonder whether they're still out there, whether they were hurt, whether something terrible had befallen them. All these things go around people's minds when their family members are missing. It's a constant cycle of an open wound remaining open and occasionally having the scar tissue even more attacked because of the psychological destruction these circumstances present. They did actually find James's belongings. They found his backpack and they found his camera that was actually in Golston Gorge, Sydney, and that was shortly after they disappeared. And they basically had just been abandoned by the side of the road, but there was absolutely no sign of James at all. We get to the 20th of January 1991. We've got 21-year-old German national Simone Schmidl. She leaves Sydney for Melbourne and the reason she's doing that is she's going to go meet her mum. They're going on a camping holiday but she just disappears en route. She was last spotted alive at least at Sydney train station and her mum knew she was coming. Her mother knew that there was no way that she wouldn't turn up for this planned camping holiday. So she actually stayed in Australia for another six weeks, just hoping and praying that her daughter would show up. But she never did. That poor woman in a foreign land, so excited to be meeting her daughter, the independent traveller, and then she never turns up. And no one knows what's happened. The loneliness, the fear, I can't even compute it as a mother. Gets to the 26th of December 1991, and there's a German couple, 21-year-old Gabor Neugebauer and 20-year-old Anja Habshid. They had left the backpackers in hostel in King's Cross, which I stayed in. I kid you not. I lived in King's Cross in Australia, and I actually did the same trip as well, going from King's Cross to Darwin, which is a hell of a long way. 
and they were going backpacking in a forest and that's the last time they're seen alive they were seen hitchhiking so even though they weren't picked up by the person who spotted them they drove past them and they noted these two people and then they just vanish without any trace just disappear into the ether and i don't know about you guys but at this point i'm like um is anybody noticing all these backpackers just going missing just disappearing without trace is anyone noticing it because there seems to be quite a lot of them because I think that if we are all accepting that all these backpackers, young people, same kind of profile, are just disappearing, you know, we could just throw out that maybe we've got a massive serial killer on our hands, guys. Honestly, I kid you not, it is in my mind just without sanity when you think about what I'm telling you in such short periods of time with these very much loved people just disappearing and no one is connecting the dots. April 1992, British backpackers, 22 year old Joanne Walters, she was from Wales and 21 year old Caroline Clark, she was from Northumberland. They're on a trip of a lifetime, traveling through Australia. They've left London, planning to work and travel abroad. They're having that OE experience of seeing the world and just expanding the horizons. They're young, full of hope, full of opportunity. So they leave Sydney and their whole premise is to plan to earn money picking it fruit in Victoria, which is no easy feat, let me tell you. But clearly it gives you your accommodation, it gives you your food, you meet other people who are young and certainly it's a way of paying yourself across Australia. The last scene in King's Cross on the 18th of April 1992 and again their parents they alert the UK authorities because these girls don't contact them they know that something terrible must have happened because they would be in contact with them and again why are we not at this moment shouting it across the airwaves across the papers that young people are disappearing we get to five months later, this is September 1992. This is orienteering group in Belanglo State Forest. And they're off walking the trails. By the way, I've been orienteering and let me tell you, it's certainly not natural to me. I just get lost all the time. I've never figured out what the different colors are on the posts. I am the kind of person that if you put me in a forest and gave me a map and said, you know, you'll need to get through there to get your food and your shelter, I'd be found six months later, remains only, because I have literally no directional sense. But these people, they were enjoying it. They're out orienteering, having a look around the most amazing forest, and they come across an unbelievably grisly discovery. They find Joanne's remains, and she's buried in a shallow grave, which must have been beyond horrific for these individuals just going out to try to enjoy themselves and be in nature and suddenly they come across this poor woman's remains and it's hard to imagine how any of those individuals who discovered Joanne could have felt because the level of unexpected trauma from that kind of impact will be something that lasts a lifetime. So Joanne hadn't just been buried in this shallow grave, she'd actually been stabbed 14 times. She was stabbed once in the neck, she was stabbed nine times in her back, she was stabbed four times in her chest. And the wound to her neck, that would have severed her spinal cord. And that meant she'd have been paralysed. Also, hair was found clutched in her hand. And that was actually later established to be her own. And its positioning suggested that she'd been trying to cover her face, to protect her face when she died. The next day, police find Caroline's body just 30 metres from her friends. She's been shot 10 times in the head. And... When they looked at the grouping of the bullets, the police believed that she'd literally been used for target practice. They also noted that a crude brick fire had been built nearby the bodies. Also, they found spent 22 caliber cartridge cases. So they know these girls have been literally executed after being tortured. Now, following the discovery of these two bodies, police then start searching the area for more human remains 
I wonder why that is. Is it because somebody was like, uh, don't want to throw it out there, guys, that there's an issue, but I don't know. I've been hearing quite a lot about all these backpackers just poof, disappearing into thin air. So you could be connected. I think we should maybe cast our net a little bit wider from just these two bodies based on all the other people who've disappeared. And by the way, why didn't we find the bodies? It was a group of orienteers who managed to do this. Maybe we need to, do we need to employ the orienteers? I think probably the orienteers are a better opportunity for us turning up any of these future bodies because I don't know, at least they make an effort to look in areas that clearly we should be doing. But they start looking around that area. They don't find anything at that point. Then we get to October 1993. And by the way, you are correct. I did say they, the investigators, the police didn't find anything. But as I say, October 1993, there's this local man, he's just looking for firewood. It's in a remote part of the Belanglo State Forest. And at this point, he finds the bodies of missing Australian backpacker James Gibson and Deborah Everest. I don't know what the police were doing. Did they just send a couple of coppers to, I don't know, go for a walk for like 20 yards either side of the circumference just to have a gander? Did they actually bother looking? We're talking about people who had disappeared, families who are broken, and it still takes a random other individual who's just out searching for firewood, which let me tell you, is a surface activity. When you go searching for firewood, you aren't digging. You aren't throwing yourself down ravines in overgrown areas. You're just picking up the wood that's available and it's dried. So it's a surface activity. If somebody looking for firewood can find a body or two bodies in this case, clearly the police were not doing their job. So these poor people are found. James Gibson and Deborah Everest, as I said, they vanished in December 1989. And the police were really perplexed because they felt that because they found James's backpack 75 miles away in Sydney, it was a surprise that his body was here. When they looked at his injuries, it was established that he'd been stabbed at least seven times in the chest and back. Also, again, his spine had been severed with a knife. So again, he's paralysed. Now, Deborah, she'd actually been stabbed once in the back, but that hadn't been a fatal injury. The way that she had died, and it's horrific, he'd beaten her to death. Skull had been fractured in multiple places. She'd had a jaw shattered. Also, her forehead had knife marks on it. And again, another notable thing is they find this crude brick fire that's been built near the bodies. So, I don't know, don't have to be a profiler, do you? To be like, hmm, backpackers' bodies, severed spine injuries, torturous activity, crude brick fire. Hmm, could they be linked, Sherlock? Police then go and search the area for more bodies. And I would imagine at this point, they've started to kind of add up in their heads that we have a problem. We really have a problem. And they're now expecting that there are potentially going to be more people who've been murdered. And it actually doesn't take them very long to find them. So the 1st of November 1993, they find the skeletal remains of Simone Schmidl. She'd vanished, remember, in 1991. They discovered that she'd been stabbed eight times. Two wounds had severed her spinal cord. So we're seeing that again. Also, she'd been stabbed in the heart, in her lungs. And her body had actually been left unburied. But again, this crude brick fire built near her body. They also found clothes at the scene, but what's really, really weird is they weren't Simone's. And that's because it would transpire that the clothes that they'd found were actually Anja Habshid's. This point, the police are realizing there is something terrifyingly clear playing out. They're knowing that there is a serious, serious link between these bodies, between these crimes. But it actually takes another three days before police find 
and Jahabshid's body, and they also find at the same time Gabor Nogabauer, and it's on a nearby fire trail. Now, they vanished in December 1991, and Anja's body was found in a shallow grave. She'd been stabbed eight times, but there was an additional feature to her death. She'd actually been decapitated, and the investigators likened her death to a ritual execution. Her head had been severed with a single clean cut. And to date, what must be very, very difficult for the family is that her skull's never been found. Gabor was also found in a shallow grave 50 metres away, and she had been shot six times in the head, three times in the base of the skull. She'd have died instantly. Now, they again find the 22 calibre cartridge cases, and they could match those to the previous crime scene. And this is building a picture of this human predator who is treating these human beings as prey, as trophies for their kill count. The authorities absolutely knew at this point the crimes were linked. Who wouldn't, with respect? You don't need to be an investigator. At the point where loads of hitchhikers are just going missing, I'd be linking it at that point, but who am I? Who am I? Obviously, I'm not an investigator, as a certain police officer sometimes reminds me online. No, I'm not. I'm not. I would have linked these crimes, so maybe it's not the right fit for me, because it seems like a lot of crimes should have been discovered and weren't discovered by the investigators who were meant to be investigating them, such as they didn't actually find the initial bodies. It was orienteers and somebody gathering wood. Now, the media get hold of this, and obviously it's a frenzy because backpackers have gone missing. Now bodies have turned up. It's clear that they're linked. So they start referring to it as the backpacker murders. And that's a good thing because you want backpackers to be aware to be forearmed, so to speak. Don't get into people's cars. Don't hitchhike. Think about the impact that getting into a vehicle could have on you. Because what we know is that literally more than one person at a time is getting murdered. So even if there's two or three of you, that does not make you safe. So this is all over the press. And when they look at the crimes themselves, well, there's a signature, isn't there? First of all, the way that the victims are buried, they tend to be laid face down with the hands tied behind the backs. Also, the killer had built a pyramid of sticks, leaves and ferns on the back. I guess there is a rudimentary attempt at covering them up, but they're seeing that pyramid of sticks, leaves and ferns, and that's very specific. Also, the bodies are buried close to the fire trails, so the police start building in this idea that this killer has a really sadistic streak. I don't know why the police actually put out that they believe the killer had a sadistic streak. This person murdered people. I mean, you don't get a non-sadistic murderer. There aren't murderers out there that are like, well, I'm actually a non-sadistic murderer. Do you kill people? Yeah, but not in a sadistic way. How is it not sadistic? I don't know, really. I mean, I think killing people probably does sound sadistic, but apparently there is a spectrum, according to police. Ivan Milat, for example, is a sadistic murderer, whereas I'm just, yeah, box standard, not that really bad, though I do kill you, and kind of in an awful way murderer. Do you know what I mean? Just throwing it out there. I don't know how they would put it together as some kind of investigative point and discovery that this person was sadistic. The reason for this incredible detective work is they believe that the victims have probably been tortured prior to the deaths, which from the injuries is clear. But like I said, when somebody murders somebody, it's sadistic. So when they looked at Joanne, James and Simone, they found that they had that common feature, the spinal cords had been severed. And what the investigators believe is that they were kept alive for a period of time. They'd have been completely paralyzed, they could have, have defended themselves, they'd have been fully helpless, and that injury, even if they had survived the attack, would have been a fully life-changing experience. But it almost feels to the investigators that this individual who's killing them enjoys making them completely vulnerable. They can't fight back. As far as that predator is concerned, they have them at their leisure. 
They also found beer bottles that had been put at the burial sites and they feel that probably he was enjoying his time there. So he probably really incapacitated his victims and then just enjoyed a beer and went back to it, drew out the experience. And when you start to actually conceive of that potential reality, it takes your breath away, doesn't it? Whenever we're talking about these cases, it can sometimes feel like we're telling a story. And part of that is because psychologically, we have to distance ourselves a little bit away from the reality and horror of what these individuals endured. But it never leaves my mind that when I'm describing this to you, when I'm talking about the fact that investigators believe that he paralyzed his victims, that he left them in fear and horror and terror, had a beer, and all the while they would have been knowing and computing that this is gonna end terribly and not knowing what's gonna happen next and knowing that whatever happens, their life has changed beyond comprehension. This actually happened. These people met their doom this way. And it's tortuous to even conceive of such terror in those last moments. That sadistic nature is obviously coming through, isn't it? The fact that he's really taking his time. Organised serial killers, they take their time, don't they? It's not just the fantasy of killing, it's the planning, engaging, the torturing, the control, domination, it's all of those things that titillate those killers. They also found smashed bottles and they believed that the reason that he smashed bottles was that he basically terrified his victims by using them as target practice. So he would be shooting guns to affect the bottles that were placed around them and obviously that was just getting incrementally closer to him actually turning the gun on them. So the psychological manipulation and agony that he placed those vulnerable, helpless people in is something that is too terrible to even imagine. And like I said, I think when we talk about these particular cases, we have to distance ourselves just a little bit to be able to manage to hear the content. But I always think just even if we do it for a second, just inhabit that moment, try to just empathise in that second, if only for a second, in what happened to those completely innocent individuals who just deserve to be enjoying their lives and instead had those lives stolen. We get to November 1993. Now this is where I would say everything changes because of an incredible human being. Investigators, they get this unexpected phone call and it changes everything. It's from a British man. I don't want to state claim to the fact that, uh, you know, the old UK got this uh, investigation, the lead it required. I'm not saying that I personally take responsibility for the work of Paul Onion, the individual who made that call. I'm just saying, it was a British man. It was a British man. It's a British man. So Paul Onions, he calls and he says, listen, I was in Australia three years earlier. That was in 1990. And he says I'd been backpacking through Australia and he'd actually recently left the Royal Navy at that point. And he just was really looking for some adventure. He wanted to have some fun. But that's not how it worked out at all. He had no idea of the real adventure, I suppose we could say, that lay in store for him. So on the 25th of January that year, he's basically hitchhiking in the Langlo State Forest. He was on his way to pick fruit in Mildura. So he's just left a shop and suddenly this moustached man just offers him a lift. He tells Paul his name's Bill. Seems like a really friendly guy. And Paul obviously is grateful. But as soon as he gets in his vehicle and the journey begins, he starts feeling really, really uneasy. So Bill starts making some really racist and xenophobic comments. First of all, he's ranting about Asian immigration and he's getting himself more and more worked up. And Paul says, it was like he was just constantly agitating himself further. He keeps checking the mirrors as well. So he's kind of looking around. 
And then at the entrance to the forest, he pulls over. And the reason that he pulls over is he says to Paul, I just want to look for a cassette tape. Now, Paul has the tingle in his fingers and toes. And he's getting really suspicious of this guy. And he was right to do so. Because this man suddenly pulls out a revolver and a length of rope. And he says to Paul, I'm going to rob you. And then they start to wrestle and he wrestles Paul to the ground. But Paul is not complying. No, they're struggling in the middle of the road and Paul is fighting back. And then he manages to break free and he starts to run. And the guy shoots at him twice, but he misses. And what's incredible about Paul, bear in mind he's been in the services, he starts running, zigzagging down the Hume Highway. And that makes it miles more difficult when somebody's trying to shoot you. If you've seen it in action movies, you've seen it in army movies, when you're zigzagging, it's difficult to get that sights and to fire and to make a kill or to injure you. So he's doing this and he's really thinking on his feet in that moment in time. He must have been absolutely horrified and terrified, but that does not dissuade the attacker. He just starts running after him, shooting, and no car stop. So at this point, he's like, listen, this guy's gonna kill me. This guy is gonna catch up with me. He's gonna shoot me. He's shown his real motive. I will die. And he makes a conscious decision. He decides to throw himself in front of the next car that pass. And I think that that is so brave. And actually, I also think that it's very common when somebody is running down a road, seemingly terrified, or may look, shall we say, manic to some degree because of the horror and fear that they're enduring, a lot of people feel uneasy, particularly if it's a man, because they wonder, is this person on drugs, under the influence? Are they gonna harm me? and so on and so forth. So no one is helping him. And I think the only way that he was ever gonna survive this was to throw himself literally at the mercy of an individual or get hit by a car, by an individual, so that they take responsibility for him because they now feel that they are engaged in that situation. So he goes ahead and does it. And the car that he throws himself in front of is driven by a woman called Joanne Berry. She had five children and her sister in the car at that time. And Paul just runs to the driver's window and he says, help me, he's got a gun. And Joanne actually looks at the other man and her gut just says, this guy is telling the truth. And she tells him to get in. She drives him to the nearby police station. And this is, bear in mind, a man who has just picked up a hitchhiker, threatened to rob him, wrestled him to the ground. When he's ran off, he's tried to shoot and kill him and he wasn't giving up chase. So that's an attempted murder. Without doubt, attempted murder. And that's how the police should have dealt with it. Because at the end of the day, this is a very, very serious crime. But for whatever reason at that time, the assailant wasn't identified. And the report just filed away and forgotten about. It's like, so what happened? I have just been chased by a man who basically abducted me, really, really threatened me, said he was going to rob me. When I didn't comply, he tried to shoot me and kill me. And he just kept chasing me. Oh, that sounds really serious. Yeah. Okay. So what do you want me to do about it? To know, just like maybe send people out maybe send the dogs out, maybe helicopters, I don't know, ask around, speak to people who might have seen him on the road because there are loads of cars ignoring me. Yeah, that seems like a, it's like a reasonable request. Okay, right, you can go now. Do you, what, do you, what, I, are we not sure, what? Didn't somebody just try to kill me? Well, I mean, there's always different theories and concepts, aren't there, when these kind of things happen, so. Have a nice day, sir. Honestly, I kid you not. Filed away and forgotten. Just forgotten. Just a raging killer out there. Let's just forget about it. So three years after that happened, fortunately, Paul Onions, who's back home in the UK at this moment in time, he sees news coverage of these bodies turning up in Belanglo State Forest and immediately makes that connection. He thinks, this is the guy 
who tried to kill me. He could be responsible. So he calls the investigators. I know I am sarcastic sometimes, but guys, think about this. First of all, we've got the orienteers finding bodies. Then we've got a guy finding fire sticks and finding bodies. Now we've got a guy basically ringing the police to say, I was attacked by a guy in very similar circumstances three years earlier and reported it to you. And now they're relying on this person to actually solve the case. I just find that spellbindingly scary. So Paul speaks to these investigators, says, I think I know who this guy could be, or at least I could recognise him if I was shown pictures of him. And so they fly him out to Australia to help with the investigation. I don't know. Maybe when he got off the plane, they were like, you can run our department, possibly. Now, fortunately, once Paul is actually flown out to Australia, they have used quite a lot of technology to really help them narrow down the list of suspects. So they've got 32 suspects at this moment in time. So the advancements and the investigation team have really improved and are starting to connect the dots, so to speak. But 32 suspects is a lot. And it's very difficult to bring somebody to justice if you've got such a long list without witnesses. Now, Paul gets shown all these photographs, but the brilliant thing is, in spite of the fact it had been three years earlier, and in spite of the fact that he would have been so highly traumatized at that moment in time, the face of the man who harmed him was burnt into his conscience. It really was. And straight away, he picked out the police's prime suspect, Milat. So at this point, Paul confirms, this is the man who called himself Bill, and this is the man who attacked me. So now the police know this is their guy and now they need to get him, they need him banged to rights. So February 1994, they start carrying out extensive surveillance on Milat's home. This is an eagle veil and they're instantly suspicious because it's really quickly established that Milat had sold his vehicle following the news that remains had been found in the Langlo State Forest. So that in itself, why? A little bit convenient there, Millat. A little bit on the convenient side there, Millat. Selling your car. One could say, because it had lots of forensic trace on it, I'm just throwing it out there as a suspicious individual. Also, investigators learn about this obsession that he's got with guns and knives. And of course, they can see his extensive criminal record and they can see his violent past. We get to the arrest date. He's 49 at this point, Millat. He's arrested on the 22nd of May, 1994. Of course, during the police investigation, in the interrogation itself, he's like, didn't do any of it, had nothing to do with it. No involvement at all in the killings. Now we do expect that, right? We do expect somebody who is being brought into the police station and is a criminal and a liar, and in this case, a massive serial killer. We expect them to, I don't know, deflect, avoid, refuse, reject. But it's quite unusual, I will tell you this, to actually have that person go, it isn't me, nothing to do with me, totally innocent. I know who it is though, it's my younger brother Richard. I mean, that in itself says something about Ivan Miller, doesn't it? I'm being arrested, potentially to be charged with serial murders. How do I work out how to get out of this? Oh, I feel like there's going to be some stuff that could turn up in my gaff. I think that maybe on my property there may be some things that may be a little bit incriminating. Unless it wasn't me. Unless it was my younger sibling, Richard. I have a lot of siblings. I can sacrifice Richard. I didn't really ever like him anyway. That's what he does. This is his younger brother, Richard. So the investigators get a warrant to search his home. And this is when they discover a whole heap of terrifying stuff. So first of all, they find his massive collection of weaponry. He's got guns, he's got knives, and one of the guns was an exact match to the murder weapon. Exact. Not sure that Richard's going to be able to take the fall for this at this point, Ivan. I think the exact match is going to be a bit of a problem for you. They've got that 22 caliber rifle, and that's connected with the crimes. Also, they find a cavalry sword. I kid you not. A cavalry sword. Yeah. Horrifying. 
that's been locked in a cupboard. And with respect, think about the injury to Anja Habshid. She absolutely had her head cut off in one foul swoop. Likelihood, it could have been that weapon that was used. And on top of all these incredibly incriminating pieces of weaponry, they also find items that have been taken from his victims. Some of them were concealed in the walls. Can you imagine this guy is trying to deny it? And like, just want to check with you, Ivan. Just going to have a little bit of a chat, yeah? You say you didn't do anything to anybody. I didn't. We found a gun and we believe a cavalry sword that could link you directly to the crimes. It was Richard. Is it your house? It's my house. Why are the victim's belongings hidden in the wall, directly linking you to the crime? I think that Richard had a key cut and he's been burrowing in my walls. Why would Richard hide the stuff if he doesn't want to incriminate himself? I mean, wouldn't he just leave them out so that you got incriminated? It's quite a sensible argument. I've not really thought about that one. Literally, this is what is going on with this Ivan Miller. So now they've got real evidence. Also, they find within the walls things like wallets, cameras, clothing. They also found in his home camping equipment, even believed that he wore some of the clothes and that he gave one of Caroline Clark's shirts to a girlfriend. So think about the psychology of that. It's about knowing that he was literally disseminating the people that he had killed clothing and items to people. He was using those trophies to be worn and adorned on living humans' backs. That's such power play. They also found other possessions at Milat's mother's house, even in the homes of some of his siblings. And the police even found a photo of him carrying a sleeping bag which belonged to one of his victims, Deborah Everest. This guy was a truly horrific example of a human predator. Now, of course, the police are thrilled. So they charge him with numerous offences. This includes Paul Onion's abduction, false imprisonment, attempted murder. And they also charge him with the murders of Australian backpackers, Deborah Everest and James Gibson, the German backpackers, Simone Schwiddel, Andrew Habsheed and Gabor Norgebauer, and also the British backpackers, Caroline Clark and Joanne Walters. They finally have him banged to rights. Now at trial, Millat, with all of this overwhelming evidence, there is forensic evidence there is literally a witness to a crime in Paul Onions. There is items in his home and disseminated to individuals that he knows. He's even pictured with a sleeping bag of one of the victims and they have the weapons that without a doubt were used in the murders. So when it comes down to the prosecution's case, let's just say it's strong, but I don't know. Millat has previously been prosecuted by such a shoddy prosecution team that he walked free. So who knows, his psychology might be so arrogant that he's like, I'm gonna plead not guilty. Yeah, that's what he does. Even though all of that evidence is there, as ever, we haven't got somebody going in going, you know what, I was banged to rights, I definitely did it. What's my punishment? I'm gonna have to accept it. No, he still thinks he can get away with it. And the way that he does this is his lawyer is like, listen, I'm not saying that it wasn't somebody with the name Millet. It was, probably. Why well, am I speaking like that? I sound like Tommy Cooper from the UK, an old comedian. Sorry, just go with me on this. Basically, the lawyer goes, it's probably one of the family, just not this man. It's one of the family, but not this one of the family. That's what he said. He didn't argue that these people hadn't been murdered by one of the Millats. They were like, yeah, one of the Millats definitely did it, but it could have been another member of the family. 
And on top of this, he suggests that the reason evidence was at Millet's home was because it was planted in Millet's home, which would have probably, to some degree, caused a little bit of reasonable doubt had it not been for Paul Onions, living witness to horrific crime where he was almost killed with a man with Ivan Millet's face. Got a problem with your argument there, Mr. Defence. What's the problem? Literally the guys identified Ivan Miller as the person with the MO doing what he did to all the other victims. I think he looks quite similar to his younger brother Richard. Could that be a possibility? No. I'm still going to just say it could be any of them. Just pick a Miller. Put any Miller in prison. That might not have been a bad idea to some degree, which we'll come on to a little bit later on. But anyway, Paul Onions, the hero that he is, he gives evidence in court, which would have been really traumatising. This is a man who knows, no doubt, that in that court, he could well have been one of the people who died. It could have been somebody talking about his body being found, and that must have been deeply traumatising. But he just ab absolutely states, Mila is my abductor, he is the man that did this. And that testimony, that without a doubt, helped to secure a conviction. Also, a pathologist gave evidence and they said that it was miles more likely when they looked at the crime themselves that Miller had not acted alone in the killings. Now, that means to some degree, maybe the old defence lawyer there was correct. It wasn't just Miller, is what he should have said. It wasn't just Miller. It was a Miller and it was him. I don't know which Miller it was, but it was Miller with a Miller. That's what they believe. The investigators really genuinely feel that Millet's siblings may also have been involved. Now, it's also worth noting that serial killers do at times work by themselves and overpower people. Think about the Otero family, BTK. It is quite possible that he could have done this alone because if you're holding somebody hostage and you have a weapon, you can often get people to comply because of the fact that they're trying to protect the other person. So ultimately, when there's two people, it might even give more leverage to the killer because they can harm one and threaten to continue harming them unless the other complies. But this is what the investigators believe. They do believe that one of Milat's or more than one of Milat's siblings may have been involved. And what also struck them and gave credence to this belief is that there have been a variety of different methods that have been used to kill them. So they're saying, you know, when we think about MOs, how somebody affects a kill, it tends to be learned dynamic behaviour. It does shift and change, but there tends to be some kind of stagnation to it, the potential way that they end their life, even though it might get better at how they perfect it, it still remains in that area. But that isn't what happened in these particular killings. Now, the pathologist, they concluded that severe force had been used in all of the murders. And they said that some of them had been gagged and bound. Others had been stabbed so viciously that their bones had been chipped. He also believed that some of them had been sexually assaulted. One of the problems that he had was that the cause of death was difficult to establish exactly because he was dealing mostly with skeletal remains, which would be very difficult. It's also worth noting that Ivan Miller, he actually denied that anybody else was involved with the killings and he could be telling the truth. After all, we do see him trying to throw Richard under the bus during the initial interrogation. Or it could be that actually Ivan Miller suddenly realises that he's going down whatever and he wants the notoriety of being seen as this heinous excuse for a human to go down in the list of serial killers, which is why that I am telling this story today. Maybe his arrogance superseded everything and he wished to stake claim for these killings all by himself. But... The injuries were terrible and, like I said, very different within corpse to corpse, essentially. Now, there was a 15-week trial. It took three days of deliberation. I'm not sure why it took three days of deliberation. I don't know whether the jury were just like, 
can we just find him guilty or do we just have some kind of pass where we can bring the whole family in and just put them in their own wing? Is that, pos is that possible? Because for me, it's very, very clear cut. Anyway, the jury do find Milak guilty on all counts. This is on the 27th of July, 1996. And absolutely as he deserved he's given life sentences for each murder without the possibility of parole i will say in spite of the fact that this is a heinous human being who clearly has been caught that doesn't mean that he feels that he should be inside he just starts making numerous unsuccessful attempts to appeal his convictions which i genuinely feel feeds into that self belief these egotistical maniacs have this sense of right to be free they don't have a conscience they don't realize that what they have stolen is so precious so powerful so life-changingly heartbreaking for the families who lose these victims that their lives stop anyone who's had a traumatic loss knows there is the you before and then there is the you after. And I'm not saying that after traumatic loss, you can't live a good life and you can't experience joy and happiness in moments, but it will never be the same. You are changed. You're changed forever. And you have that punctuation mark between the then and the now and the forever and you would give anything to move back to that moment before it happens. That's what he did to every single one of those families. He stole their then, and he created their now. And yet he feels his right to walk free. Is it just me? I want him to be sent back to the hard labor camp for eternity. Fortunately, that will happen, you know, at the end of the day. I don't feel that our lives just end in this domain and dimension, and I'm sure there's a whole lot of interesting opportunities and activities for individuals like Milat. We get to May 1997. This is just a year into his sentence. It's actually less than a year into his sentence, and he's at Maitland Prison. And 52-year-old Milat actually attempts to escape. So he doesn't even want to accept the sentence he's trying to get out and he gets to do this with another fellow inmate 46 year old george savas now george savas was a really notorious drug lord and he was also a former sydney councillor i kid you not i did say that in a sentence what's that emma george savas bit of a drug lord yeah drug lord wait a minute emma. didn't you say george savas former sydney Councillor, yeah, 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 you know, councillor on the council, running the area. A little bit of a conflict there, George. Gonna throw it out there. But essentially, yeah, that's what was going on. I think we can all agree we have periods in time, even in the most developed of countries, where we take a sharp intake of breath and think, how did that happen? Anyway, he'd avoided a murder conviction essentially, but he was in prison. Apparently there'd been this alleged gangland killing and they felt that he was linked to it, but he ended up being served a 30 year sentence for importing a large shipment of heroin in 1994. Just what you'd expect your local councillor to be bringing in. If they're not bringing in a whole ship worth of heroin, what are they doing? How are they spending the time? That literally happen literally happen guys now we've got a note that savas had actually already escaped from prison once and the reason that they discovered this second attempt by savas and at this point Millat is that prison staff discovered an escape plan they had all these hidden listening devices cameras undercover agents and obviously because they do make this attempt Millat is moved to goldborn supermax prison that's actually what it's called, Supermax Prison. I love Australians, what a great thing. Supermax, sounds like some kind of hero movie, but it's not, it's a prison. Now, Savas was actually found hanged in his cell just hours after the failed escape attempt. I don't know, 
Maybe he did it to himself. Maybe he didn't. You have quite a few enemies when you're a drugs lord and a local councillor. Also, we know that sometimes things happen in prison that shouldn't happen in prison. I'm not saying. It just always strikes me that, you know, after an attempt of escape and he's done that for the second time, then he ends up hanging in his cell. Did he kill himself or were they like, he's too much of a hassle of a prisoner? Maybe not, or maybe. Now, Miller, obviously because of his escape plan and also because he is an extreme high risk category inmate, he was treated in a way that I think is appropriate whilst he was in prison. So when outside of his cell, he was escorted in ankle cuffs all the time by two officers. On Australia Day in 2009, Miller actually decided to force the issue of getting a further appeal for himself. And you know how he did this? Because bear in mind, he's now aware that he's not going to be able to escape. There's literally two officers whenever he's out of his cell. And he's thinking to himself, you know what? How am I going to get the attention of those in the authority who are going to listen to me because I want to be free? And I know that as an individual who wishes to be free, I need to show that I have a state of mind that people can trust. And if they're going to appeal and believe that I'm either reformed or maybe an innocent individual, I really need to do something that isn't going to make them think Milat is certainly somebody we should not have walking our streets. And so he goes ahead. Like I said, Australia Day 2009 is like, I know, oh, this is going to work. So he just saws his little finger off his left hand with a plastic serrated knife. Yeah. Plastic, serrated knife. I'm imagining it didn't happen very fast, although psychopaths do tend to have a higher pain threshold. I'm just picturing it with one of those knives you get from the chippy when you get your chippy dinner on a Friday night. Just sawing your little finger off with a plastic serrated knife. And apparently the reason that he did this was he planned to post it to the High Court. Could you imagine just being a judge there, getting your mail in the morning? Oh, this is off that convicted serial killer, Ivan Miller. Tried to blame his brother, though his brother might have been involved, who knows. He's always not having a good time, he wants an appeal. What's that? I can't see this. It's a bit brownie, brownie red. It's a bit brownie. Oh, there's a lump down here. It's a... Are you kidding me? Miller's only gone and sent me his little finger. I think he's perfectly safe to be released. I kid you not, this really happened. Not the bit that I've just done. That's just a complete reenactment of what I imagined in my head. Now, the doctors were ultimately unable to reattach it. So he never got his little finger back. So he could have sent it to the High Court. It wouldn't have made a difference. And then in 2011, he decides he's going to go on hunger strike after being refused a PlayStation. That's right. He was refused a PlayStation and he felt that was good enough reason to go on a hunger strike. Now, let me tell you, there have been people in this world, from the suffragettes through to individuals in other countries who've literally died on hunger strike, that they've believed so greatly in justice and a cause. And we also see people like Ian Brady, who was one of the Moors murderers. He went on hunger strike. He nearly died a few times and he was actually force fed at points. They wouldn't let him die because actually it's important that they serve their sentence. They are in prison for life, serving that sentence and they will serve it. So there are people with mindsets, both malevolent like Brady and also those with great care and compassion for society like the suffragettes and so on and so forth. But I'll tell you what differentiates those from the ordinary person. It's willpower. Starving oneself to death is incredibly challenging. The impact that it has on your body, the emaciation that's involved, the cravings that occur, the damage to your vital organs and so on and so forth. So when somebody goes on a genuine hunger strike, as I said, whether that's malevolence like Brady or to do with politics and power and change like those I've mentioned, it takes real metal to do it. And Miller didn't have any. Didn't have any. Didn't last very long at all. And I mean, not long at all. He liked his food too much. 
So it was more of a childish paddy. And at the end of the day, I don't care if he gets a PlayStation because I think he should be too busy on the hard labor camp that really he should be doing stones, moving them to another place, stones, moving them to another place, stones, moving them to another place. That's what I think for an individual like this. Just throwing it out there. Now, in May 2019, Miller actually got diagnosed with advanced esophageal cancer, and they also found that it had spread to his bones, to his liver, and to his lymph glands. In the final days of his life, the police obviously had a really important job to do. They needed to know if there were any more bodies. So they ended up speaking to him on a numerous amount of occasions. They wanted him to confess to any other unsolved murders that is committed. But Milat doesn't care. There wasn't any form of deathbed redemption for him. He just refused to disclose any further details. And that in itself, demonstrates the true mind of a serial killer. He isn't concerned about anybody else's feeling. He has no sorrow for the lives he's stolen. He has no respect for the families he destroyed. His arrogance, his narcissism just runs through his veins. After destroying the lives of so many, he chose not to give closure to the families of his other undiscovered victims. And you know what? He continued to claim his innocence and he told the detectives, I don't care, that's it. He maintained control to the end. He remained a callous monster. He died shortly after 4 a.m. on the 27th of October, 2019, aged 74. God, that seems unfair. It seems unfair that in those final days, he was given pain relieving medication. I mean that. He tortured his victims and yet he was afforded the safety, sanctity, sanctuary of medication that eased his agony. When you consider the physical and psychological pain and torment that he subjected his victims to, did he have a right to that? On a positive note though, I think the minute that he took his last breath, the Grim Weeper would have been stood next to him, I don't know, with a few cavalry swords, maybe some pistols, a fire pit of eternity, and he would have just escorted Mr Millat and his non-confessed realities to the scenarios that he should have offered closure to, so that he can think about that for the rest of eternity, whilst he has pokers that are very hot, inserted in places that are not very nice, so that he can just have a long, hard think forever about what he did. Now, it's really sad, of course, that Miller may have taken the secret of his true body count to the grave, because the authorities genuinely don't think that the bodies that they found are the only bodies that he created. They believe he's responsible for many more killings. They think possibly as many as 20. But let's be honest, because of the remote nature of the terrain where he disposed his victims, it could be far more. And finding the bodies, 20 or more, it's going to be almost impossible. Unless, as we've talked about prior to this, People who are out there for other reasons happen to stumble across them. He never in his entire time in prison admitted responsibility for any of the killings. He never expressed a moment, a second of remorse. Although, and this is a little bit bizarre, apparently he confessed to his mother on her deathbed that he was indeed the backpacker murderer. How does that go? I'm really near the end, Ivan. I'm really near the end. Oh, Mum, I'm really sorry. I think I can see the lights. Ah, oh, Mum, before you go. Yeah, Ivan, I think they're here for me. I'm pretty sure I can hear the music of the angels. Yeah, Mum, you know the backpackers' murders? Yeah, I do. It's a terrible situation, isn't it? Richard seems really interested. Well, it's not Richard, it's me. Ugh. Sorry, that was a terrible reenactment. 
I'm just saying, it's not what you want, is it, as a parent? You want them to be like saying, I love you so much. You're the best woman in the world. I'm a really good human being. I'm so pro-social that they're probably going to give me some kind of, I don't know, award for it. You don't want somebody to be telling you that they're a major murderer. That's not a comfortable death for a parent. Now, it's thought that of his other victims, they may have been 18-year-old Peter Letcher, so 1987 peter had actually traveled to sydney he wanted to propose to his 15 year old girlfriend god bless him but she's 15 and she just said to him i don't want to get married i'm too young so at that point he ends up hitchhiking back to his parents home obviously deflated and sad but he couldn't have imagined that that would be the last trip he ever took because he just disappeared that was the 21st of January, 1988. And they actually found his remains. So bushwalkers discovered him. And it was in the remote area of Jenilan State Forest. He was really badly decomposed. But his body was lying face down in a shallow ditch. He'd been shot multiple times in the body. He'd been stabbed multiple times in his back. He'd been shot five times in his head, as well as the location of the body as well. That is so indicative of somebody just like Milat killing him. I mean, that's absolutely descriptive of how Milat acts and operates in these killings. You know, the posing of the body face down, the remains covered in the branches and the leaf litter, which was seen in the other killings. There was an empty whiskey bottle nearby and the murder weapon had been a 22 caliber rifle. I mean too many coincidences there, right? Now on Millet's deathbed, his lawyer confirmed what many had suspected. Millet had not acted alone. The lawyer claimed that Millet's sister, yeah, sister, had taken part in the killings of the British backpackers, Caroline and Joanne. Can you believe that? His sister. She'd been living with Millet at the time and that actually corroborates some of the evidence that they found near Caroline's body. Cigarette butts had been found. Now, Millet didn't smoke, but his sister did. Now, she has already and always denied being involved. But it's chilling that apparently Millet told his lawyer that she did it with him. Now, chillingly, it seems that murder runs through the Millet family. I kid you not. Bear in mind the suspicion that some of his siblings were involved. Well, 2010, his great nephew, 19 year old Matthew Miller, brutally killed a former friend. 17 year old David Octoloni, he was murdered on his birthday. On his birthday, can you believe that? Matthew Miller and two others took David into the Belanglo State Forest. This is, as you know, where Ivan Miller had already killed many of the victims. They took that boy there on his birthday on pretense of drinking and smoking weed to celebrate. They took video footage before the attack and it shows David just rolling joints in the front seat of the car, just being with his mates. And then it happens. Soon after that video is taken, Matthew Miller strikes David with a two-headed axe without warning. Out of nowhere. Then he ordered him to stay down and stare at the ground. He accused him of telling people that he'd stolen money from his mother. And David could be heard pleading, repeatedly denying doing anything. And Milat intermittently just strikes him with an ax during this time. And then he just strikes David with his final blow in the head whilst his accomplice made an audio recording of the killing on his mobile. That recording was later played in court to David's horrified family. They weren't even allegedly warned in advance of what they'd hear. They had to listen to the sound of the axe striking David's skull. It was so clearly audible. They had no idea that was going to be played. And then they had to listen to David's guttural moans. The day after that killing, Matthew Miller 
even went ahead and bragged to his friends. He said, you know me, you know my family. I did what they do. I killed someone last night. Now he was sentenced to 43 years in prison in 2012. And we can only hope that he ends up in similar circumstances to his uncle. Let's hope he never walks the streets again. That's all I can throw out there. Let's hope this guy will never be freed. Because what he did to David is just unspeakably terrible. Now, the legacy of Ivan Millet's crimes, it lives on, not just through the crimes of his extended family, keep it in the family, bit of DNA issues there, maybe check the genes, probably do some brain scans on the family, might have some good information there on how to spot a serial killer or violent predator, just throwing it out there. But aside from that, the reason that Ivan Millet lives on, shall we say, is because of popular culture. The film Wolf Creek, which, as I said at the very beginning of this, terrified me. They believe that that's based on his crimes. So in the film, spoiler if you haven't seen it, the killer adopts a signature of Millat's, the infamous head on a stick. So severs the victim's spinal cord, paralyzing them. So they're just a head on a stick, essentially. And I tell you, it's scary enough to watch in that film. I can't even begin to conceive of what it would have been like for Milat's victims to live through. And I can only hope that none of the remaining members of the Milat clan take up the serial killing reins and that any future Milat-esque murders simply remain the stuff of horror film fiction. I hope you found me covering this case interesting. I hope maybe I've given you some added value. I know so many of you have asked for this case. I hope I've done it justice. Like I said, if we could just take a moment, as we always do when we're watching these and talking about these and discussing these, let's just remember that we're talking about real people. These young people who had their lives just stolen in such torturous and terrifying manners. This really happened. Ivan Miller is the stuff of nightmares, but he walked among us and he killed among us. And when you watch things like Wolf Creek, it's easy to stand to the side and imagine that it's just something that is in the movies. But in these cases, the characters that are played out are based on people's lives that were taken and I always just take a moment to really think of that when I'm telling these stories, these very true realities. And also for the families who never had their backpacking family members back at a time where they should have been celebrating the return of their adventures and the descriptions and stories they would have, they were actually dealing with their disappearance and never getting the answers. For some, those answers never came and for others, they came with a legacy too horrific to even imagine. Let me know your thoughts. If you found this case interesting and you like my content, please subscribe, it really helps. Thanks for all your comments. Also, before I go, just a big shout out to my Patreon and my YouTube membership. You make this possible. The only reason that I'm sat here being able to speak to you about these cases is because of the support that you give me. And as everybody knows here, a view, a like, all of that matters massively. Thank you so much. If you have not subscribed and you've found this interesting, please do. Remember, Wednesdays and Sundays, I will always be here. Make sure you are too. See you again, guys. Be safe.